Right, good morning family. Um, from the first message of the extended lockdown, it's been quite an uh, interesting time, I guess. Uh, yeah, for a lot of us, I think uh, it's been pretty, pretty rough. Um, I can say, thinking of everyone at this time, I know that Shaw and I, um, we have a challenge with the, with the toddlers. It's been, it's been quite uh, interesting. But um, yeah, we, we've had a couple of days that have been particularly challenging, I guess. But uh, we're grateful for our garden. We're grateful for the space we have inside as well. The boys have a place to, to play. Um, it's just, I think they're starting to feel it as well, that they... Um, they want to go and see their grandparents, for instance, and we started to they started to get breaking points. So about eleven days to go. Um, let's hope for let's hope for the best, and we can actually start visiting people again. And I just want to shout out to all of those families who have um, children at school, or yeah. You know, so to the parents, um, strength to you guys. Um, it's quite hectic being a parent as well as a teacher um, in that household. So strength you guys in keeping on top of that work. Um, being teachers in our household, we found it quite challenging to support the children as well as being, um, as well as facilitating um, our actual classes as well. It's been quite an interesting, interesting thing to juggle. But um, yeah, I'm also thinking of you guys who are school goers. The, the teenagers, obviously, I don't know if the, if the youngsters are going to be listening too much to this, to this, but um, I would say to anyone who's at school, if you're listening to this and to the varsity goes, um, yeah, strength to you guys during this time. I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the air, so we don't know what's going to happen with the year. We don't know where it's going to go. Um, just coming from an education perspective, as a teacher, I find it quite a, yeah, I try not to think too far ahead and just take it day by day. So strength to you guys. Um, I know that there's quite a battle between, that everybody's struggling with at the moment with relaxing. Um, relaxing in a holiday mindset like playing xbox or reading a book um, and being productive um, during the day so well done to you to you guys who've actually got to be productive i think it's quite a quite a tough one as well um, but just know that those of you who are struggling in that battle you're not alone we're all struggling with this i just want to urge you something that dave actually said quite a while ago about staying connected it's a huge thing um Stay connected to whoever you can or to the people in the church um, in whatever way you can. We've got, uh, we've got lots of technology that can help us with that. And uh, even if it's through video games when you're online with a friend, you know, just connect, just chat, have a, have a little bit of a moment, you know, um, do it. If you're thinking of someone during the lockdown, if God's put someone in your mind, just send them a message. Send them a message. Uh, just send them a voice note even. It's not, nice to have, just have that connection. I just find that such a incredible impact you never know what god can do with just a simple thing like a message and people feel like i'm aware this person's thinking about me god is in those moments um so all in all i think receiving a message from someone saying that they care about you it just always feels really good so yeah um just for for today um dave dave um introduced us to galatians last week and thanks to karen last week to for sharing um the, the message on peace. I think it was just so brilliant to listen to. And uh, I'm sure all of you were touched by that. And to continue, we, we're going through Galatians at the moment in our church. And um, I was actually reading through Galatians um, while, a while ago. And I told Gav that uh, Galatians 3 actually stirred me quite a bit. And he said that the church is actually going to move into exploring Galatians. I got excited and I knew right there that I had to talk on Galatians 3. Um, so to start off, Understanding Galatians, um, Paul obviously was Saul. Um, he wrote this letter to the Galatians, uh, to the church in Galatia, sorry. Um, and Galatians 3 is when he, def he actually defends his theology, um, particularly around, the, the, around um, the idea of grace versus law. And um, I found that quite stirring, up, um, ba mainly because we've got, we've got quite an interesting uh, dynamic in the world today where a lot of people are challenging the Christian faith, and I just love the way that Paul um, tackles those questions about well, what is that, what is the law actually here for, or I don't understand grace that much. And I think Galatians has got such an incredible message. The way that the way that Paul teaches the the church of Galatia, this is this is the way that God actually wanted us to live. Listen to this, listen to this. There's such truth in that, um, and. Uh, 
I've also been reading a different translation. I know Karen read last week from the Passion Translation. That's what I've been reading as well. It's just a beautiful way to um, to just see the message uh, of God in, in, in very, very, very different. It brings, it brings about different, different illustrations for me, and I find it quite edifying and quite, um, I'll just say like a breath, of, a breath of fresh air, excuse me. So... Um, if you guys can turn to Galatians three with me, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna jump down a little bit and and do Galatians Galatians three verses twelve and and thirteen to start off. And the first little bit it all talks about um, it all just talks about how um, God's plan all along was to give the the um, the the message of hope or basically. Um, he put his he put his his ideas into a, into Abraham and said this is what this is the promise that I've made to everybody and then the law coming later. Um, I'll just go to twelve and thirteen. Um, I mean, you can even look you can even look at eleven. It says for the scriptures reveal. Let's go to eleven. For the scriptures reveal, and it is obvious that no one achieves the righteousness of God by attempting to keep the law. For it is written, those who have been made holy will live by faith. But keeping the law does not require faith, but self-effort. For the law teaches if you practice the principles of law, you must follow all of them. Yet Christ paid a full price to set us free from the curse of the law. He absorbed it completely as he became a curse in our place. For it is written, everyone who is hung upon a tree is doubly cursed. Um, and if you look at those things, if we just go back to 11, I'm glad I actually said 11. So let's call it 11 to 13 there. It says the scriptures reveal that everyone that, that no one rich, achieves righteousness by God by attempting to keep the law, and then it says in verse twelve, keeping the law does not does not require faith but self effort. Um, I found that quite an interesting thing to think about because self effort in my in my understanding just comes from our strength. We are putting our strength into something that we are trying to achieve, and if we're trying to achieve something through self effort, something of this. Of this stature, something that that we can attain. If we're trying to attain um, righteousness by self or through self-effort, I don't know if us as human beings or if we as human beings can understand that self-effort is never going to actually attain that. We'll get to that now. We're never going to get to what Christ promised us. Um, self-effort is actually mean for me. That's a you're putting a burden on yourself in order to be able to say I can buy this. Um, and, uh, and it says in 13, Christ paid the full, full price to set us free from the curse of the law. And for, e for everyone who is hung upon a tree is doubly cursed. So he's actually been doubly cursed. I mean, we celebrated Easter last week. And thank you, Dave. Um, sorry, Karen didn't speak last week. She spoke two weeks ago. Last week's Easter. Dave with the awesome message last week. And I just feel like celebrating Easter. I mean, the entire understanding of the Christian faith is based upon the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that he was doubly cursed on the cross and then resurrected from that. He came and he's clean. He's cleaned us all. It's such an incredible message. Um, and so if I think about those things, about buying, about buying um, righteousness or buying love, Let's just put those into uh, put those into some illustrations, some analogies, maybe some stories that we can understand. So, if my wife, let's say, in any time really, but I would I always think about early, early um, or newlyweds, and if I get home and I realize that my wife isn't home yet, and I uh, and I go and start cleaning the house, and I just I clean up, I go crazy, uh, I clean the lounge, I clean the kitchen, I do the dishes, I make the bed, um, take out the trash, you know, to hang up the washing, whatever. The point is that I do all of these chores, and uh, I get, I get, I, I, I like wait for my wife to get to come home, and she comes home, and I just wait for her like this, because I mean I know I'm, I'm one, one of my love languages is affirmation, just to be honest. So um, I want her to say, "Ooh, well done, thank you," you know, and and then I feel nice about myself. But if I if I actually sit there and wait for her to come home, and I say, "Can you see everything I've done for you?" Do you love me now? Um, let's throw a different one into this perspective here and say to my, like I've got my children here and I say, and if my children, um, do I only love my children because of all the nice things that they do for me? You know, let's say that, let's say that they go and they do something really cool and I say, oh, well done, my boy. And they definitely feel loved in that thing. But do I love them because of what they have done or do I love them for who they are? Um, 
and I feel like humans have got this terms and conditions understanding where terms and conditions apply. So I love you if you do this or I love you because you've done that. And um, it's such an incredible thing because terms and conditions are really the opposite of what unconditional is. Unconditional love is what Christ did. He did it because he loves us, not because of what we need to do in order to win anything or in order to buy something. Um, grace is ultimately an incredible gift. It's a gift. It's given. We don't have to buy anything. We don't have to spend anything. We don't have to use anything of our own in order to get that. All we have to do is believe in Jesus and you will have eternal life. It's just such an incredible message itself. Um, so terms and conditions are something that we, as, as, as humans, what we've done is we've started to really wire our brains about what can I do in order to get something for it. And um, it's, it's, it's totally the opposite of that. Unconditional love is what grace is. He's given us this gift. We are getting everything and we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. So let's move on to Galatians 3 verse 15 to 19. Um, verses 15. Um, the law versus God's promises. So I'm just going to read this all and then we'll, we'll unpack it. Beloved friends, let me use an illustration that we can all understand. Technically, when a contract is signed, it, can be, it can't be changed after it has been put into effect. It's too late to alter the agreement. Remember the royal proclamation God spoke of Abraham to, and to Abraham's child. God said that his promises were made to pass on to Abraham's child, not children. And who is this child? It's the son of promise, Jesus, the anointed Messiah. This means that the covenant between God and Abraham fulfilled in Messiah cannot be, altum, cannot be altered. Let me say that again. This means that the covenant between God and Abraham was fulfilled in the Messiah and cannot be altered. Yet the written law was not given to Moses until 430 years later. After God had signed his contract with Abraham. The law then doesn't supersede the promise since the royal pro proclamation was given before the law. If that were the case, it would have nullified what God said to Abraham. We receive all the promises because of the promise one, not because we keep the law. And it says in verse 19 there, why then was the law given? Here's the answer. It was meant to be an intermediary agreement added after God gave the promise of the coming one, it was given to show men how guilty they are. And it remained in force until the seed was born to fulfill the promise given to Abraham. When God gave the law, he didn't give it to them directly. He gave it first to the angels and he gave it to Moses, the mediator, who then gave it to the people. So what we have to understand is quite a mouthful. Um, it's quite a few things to, to take there. But what I feel is very important there is that when what he said was there is a there is a when a contract is signed, there is a um, we're going to speak about a verbal agreement now. A verbal agreement was made between God and Abraham. He signed it with Abraham and he said, this is what I promised to you. This is what I promised to you. And the promise was made then when he promised it to Abraham. Then the law was only written was only written and given to Moses 430 years later. Now, if, if we were supposed to live by the law, that means that it would nullify everything that God said to Abraham because now we've got something new. But that's not what would happen because that was signed. You cannot alter it. You can't alter what God said to Abraham. Christ is going to come. He's going to pay for your sins. He's going to do all of this stuff. So what we have to understand as well is this, that there is a covenant that God made right in the beginning and it was a promise that grace is going to come and, and it's going to actually override everything that is going to happen in this world. So we have to, we, we have to uh, let, me, let me just read this last little bit here. Um, so if we look at verse 21 and 22, okay, let's look at 20 first. Now, a mediator does not represent just one party alone, but God fulfilled it by himself. Now, this is where, this is where it all comes together. Since that's true, we should, consider the, should we consider the written law to be contrary to the promise of new life? How absurd. Truly, 
If there was a law that we could keep, which would give us new life, then our salvation would come by law keeping. But the scriptures make it clear that since we are all under the power of sin, we needed Jesus. And he is the Savior, Savior who brings the promise to those who believe. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So let's let's have a let's have a great if we just look at that again you say if if there was such a law that could that could give us new life then we could ultimately buy our salvation all we had to do is keep the law i could just have a list of things okay so what do i need to do in order for me to get salvation i just need to do this and this and this and this that is a religious mindset we have to buy everything. We have to do things. We have to make sure that we are checking all these boxes in order to gain our salvation one day. But that's not what it says here. That's not what it says. It says here, that is absurd. The scriptures make it clear that we're all under the power of sin and we need Jesus. Because if you believe in him, you will have eternal life. Grace ultimately is going to come through Jesus when you believe in him. And he says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The law was there to show us that we're guilty. The law was there to make sure that we know, oh my word, I need Jesus so much. I find this, it opens up quite an interesting question because um, a lot of people normally say that they, um, that they, question, they question whether we are robots or not. You know, like does God, if God knows our every step, then uh, surely we, we don't have choice in life. And um, I'm sorry to open this up now. It's actually taking me down a little bit of a tangent. But it's quite an interesting thing because love is ultimately a choice. You know, Jesus said that we need to be able to, um, we need to choose him. And when we choose him, that means we will have eternal life. Um, a man that is holding a, a gun in front of a girl's head and he chooses to shoot her. Why can't God stop that bullet? Well, if he stops that bullet, then he's, he's, he's taking the man's choice away. And therefore, that man hasn't chosen Jesus at the end of the day. It's quite a, it's quite a hectic thing to, to understand. But this is the thing that I come to in this moment, is that you won't understand how much you need Jesus when Jesus is your only choice. I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. When you get to the point where you're so broken, where you're so understanding of your weakness, where you're so you're overwhelmed by, oh my word, my life is actually insanely, insanely dark. I can't do this anymore. This is hectic. When you get to that moment, your only choice is actually turning to Jesus. I mean, isn't that such a beautiful thing at the end of the day? We get to choose him. And ultimately, all of our life is pointing to him anyway, because it's contrary to what he wanted for us. We will only have life through him. I hope that makes sense. Um, so... Let's let's look at the, let's look at Peter quickly when we talk about grace. Um, so Peter was the guy. We all know Peter, the disciple. Um, he was actually the guy that was evangelizing more than us. You know, he was the passionate one. Oh, come on, Peter! This guy, no ways, Lord, I will never deny you. He was he was the worshiper in the front row. Yeah, come on, Jesus. Puffed his chest up, told Jesus that he would never deny him. And Jesus is like, you're going to deny me. It's like, no way. We'll never do that. Brian Johnson actually said this. Peter was confident in his ability instead of, his, instead of acknowledging his weakness, which contributed to an illusion of strength. And then a day later, he denied Jesus. After telling Jesus, I won't do it. A day later, he denied it. I want to say that again. Instead of acknowledging his weakness, which contributed to an illusion of strength, a day later, Jesus denied Jesus. Now, how does that happen? Somebody who's so confident, so passionate in Jesus, I'll tell him to his face, I won't do this. And he just does it like that. Well, that's exactly how it happens, isn't it? There is an illusion that we can have, uh, that we can have sometimes, well, that we can, okay, let me say this again. There is an illusion that we can sometimes have that we are passionate for God, but we are maybe more confident in our own passionate personality than we are in clinging to an illusion of strength rather than clinging to the cross that gave us grace as a gift. It is only by grace that we can 
even lift a shout of praise to him. I mean, that for me just encapsulates something so hectic about our lives as, as Christians. Sometimes we get so clouded by how passionate, how confident we are in our life. This is who I am. Come on, man. This is great. This is great. And we get so confident in the illusion that we cling to this illusion and to this false strength rather than clinging to who Jesus is. Because authenticity and authentic Jesus is ultimately what we, what we need to be striving for because then we are going to find full grace. Full grace. Living under grace. Do we live for grace or do we live from grace? You know, it's something that's incredibly powerful. Being authentically passionate is understanding that we have a gift that we cannot repay. There is nothing, no law, no deed, nothing that we can do to repay the repay God for the gift that He gave us in Jesus and His grace displayed from the cross. That is why we should be choosing every day to live righteously. We don't act in sin because we know we are saved by grace. We choose to live righteously because we have been given a gift that cannot be repaid. Um, if someone gives me a guitar, I mean, I can pay them back for the guitar. You know, Jesus has given us this incredible gift that you know. You sit here and you just go, oh, my word, I do not deserve this. I don't deserve this. Lord, this is amazing. I, what can I do to repay you? Nothing. There is nothing you can do that is going to ever repay God for what he has given us. So in gratitude, in gratitude, our lives need to be geared towards, Lord, I am doing this for your glory. I'm living for your glory now. That's why I'm going to choose to live righteously. I am living for you. I am choosing to do this. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. Because why? Because wow, this is an amazing gift. So to close off ministry time, um, in, our home, in our own homes, it's quite tough to do this ministry when you can't do, hey, I want to pray for you. But I just want to take a moment to pray for you. Um, it's interesting putting my hand towards my phone, but <laughs> I just hope that through this, God can 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 still touch us. I know He can. He's so amazing in this ways, uh, in all of His ways. Um, can you respond to His gift while I pray for you? Um, I want you to thank Him. I want you to choose. Some of you are sitting there and you are thinking to yourselves, "Yo, uh, I'm actually doing something that I shouldn't be doing," or. Um, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm living in that false passion. You know, I'm, I'm too confident in what I in what I live. I need to be humbled again. Um, so there's a couple of things that I can that I can put on. But choose to live a righteous life right now. Just uh, I just want to pray over that. Um, so let me do that right now. Father, we just want to thank you for the for everyone listening. We want to thank you for congregation. We want to thank you for Fountain Vineyard. Lord, we. We pray right now, Father. We pray for these people, Lord, as they're standing there or sitting there or whatever they're doing, maybe even just putting on washing on the line or whatever they're doing while they're listening to this. Lord, I just pray that you'll speak to their hearts and show them. Show them who you are. Show them, Father God, that you are the God that has given us grace. This gift is incredible, Jesus. We thank you so much for this. And in this moment, Father, as they choose to start living a more righteous life or even begin this journey of righteousness, Lord. And I, I, I just want to say, I just feel like I need to define righteous living. Righteous living is choosing the right way, choosing the good things, choosing the things that are not sin, choosing all of those. And we do it because we are thanking Jesus. We are wanting to do this. We are wanting to live. Don't do it because you have to. It's not about a have to thing. We want to. Because of what you've given us, Lord. And so we choose right now, Father, to live a righteous life. In Jesus' name. Um, thank you, Lord, for this family. And I just want to thank you for listening as well. It's just amazing that we can still do church like this. Um, don't forget to send a message to those people that God's putting on your mind um, during this time. And uh, have a great 11 days of lockdown. Cheers, guys. Thanks.